So now, uh, please uh, let me invite Mr. Jad Shah. He will uh, present some also uh, informative information about uh, routing security in the Middle East. Okay, marhaba, sabah al khair, Jamian. My name is Jad. I work for the RIPE NCC, and I'm going to talk about routing security. I hope you can tolerate some more numbers because I'm going to do so from a statistics point of view. Right? But before I start talking about routing and the security aspects of it, we need to understand a little bit the digital ecosystem here in the region. And I'm going to reiterate a little bit of the things that uh, Alvaro already mentioned, right? Because at the end of the day, it's IPv4, IPv6 addresses, ASN numbers, and members being active in the sea, right? So what is the LAR landscape in the Minog region? As you can see, the Middle East is consistent in terms of the percentage of the total number of LARs as compared to the uh, total number of LARs in the service region that the RIPE NCC covers. So that's 6%. Um, the bigger players here being Turkey, obviously, for the size of it, but then it's followed by Iraq, Lebanon, uh, and Saudi Arabia, and of course the UAE. And in terms of the IPv4 address space that is held by the LARs in the MENOG region, this is also consistent uh, to 6%. Again, this is uh, the percentage of the total LARs or total IPv4 space held in the service region of the RIPE NCC. This is not uh, on a global scale. Now, let's focus a little bit on IPv4, and later on I'll talk a little bit about IPv6, I promise. So in terms of IPv4 in the MENOG region, we wanted to see, okay, we have all of these LARs, but do they have IPv4 addresses, right? It might sound a little bit silly or counterintuitive, like why would you be an LAR, but you don't have an IPv4 allocation? So we wanted to look into that. And uh, I, I can say that overall, throughout our service region, we found out that 9% of the LARs they never had any IPv4 allocations. I have to say, this doesn't mean that they are not using IPv4. We're just saying that they never requested an allocation from the RIPE NCC. Um, this is also consistent with the Western Europe uh, region. So we wanted to look at the MENOG region specifically, and it turns out that we're doing slightly better, 8%. So that's good. But we did find two exceptions here which were Oman and the UAE. In both countries, 22% of the LARs, they never requested um, IPv4 address. But that could be for many reasons. We decided to look into that a little bit to understand why this happened. And it turned out that the majority of these LARs, they recently became LARs. So you can see, like for example, uh, they joined in 2022 or 2021, 2020. So this is when the IPv4 waiting list got introduced, etc. So this is actually a good thing. It means that um, there are new players coming to the scene. Probably they are investigating some IPv6 options. Maybe they are waiting to get their IPv4. But it's good. It means that new players are coming, and we always want to see this. There were two exceptions to this uh, phenomenon that we found in uh, the UAE. And these were the, the FM, I think that's the financial markets, and the uh, DP world. So these are LARs that have been members of the NCC for more than 10 years, and they never got an IPv4 allocations. But don't worry, we investigated a little bit more, and it turned out that they have PI space. So they are using IPv4 addresses, um, but they just never asked for an allocations, uh, allocation of their own. So things are okay. Now in terms of IPv6, you've seen this slide before. Um, it's pretty um, diverse in the region, let me put it this way. Um, Overall, if we take like a bird's eye view for the MENOG region, we're not doing uh, well as compared to the service region or to Western Europe. But if we take like look at individual countries like Alvaro did, you can see that Saudi Arabia is ranked in the top 5% and 
the UAE follows that. It ranks between the top 10 to top 15 percent of uh, economies in the world that run IPv6. So, but, but you can see that, right? And there's a reason why I included this slide on IPv6. I'm going to touch on it later on. So let's start talking about routing, right? Because after all, this is the title of my presentation. Um, everything that runs on top of the internet in terms of routing happens because of BGP, right? It's a very fascinating protocol. Like uh, the last version of it uh, standardized in 1994, we still use it till today. One can say it's as impressive as DNS, but let's not get into that. So how does routing happen on the internet? So basically, we have two networks. I'm simplifying things here. Let's say network A has a certain range, 193.something, and network B has a range of 194.something. And they each have an ASN number. So what BGP does is the following. Let's say I'm A. I tell you, hey, this is my ASN number. These are my IP addresses. And it stops here. This is what everything that BGP was designed to do. So the real question here, can you trust me? So can you trust that I'm saying the truth? And the same logic applies when all of you start announcing stuff to me. Do, can I trust you? And BGP inherently, like within the BGP protocol, does not provide a mechanism to fight this or to, to, to answer this. There are some things that we do on, on the side. And because of this caveat, this opens the door to accidents. And accidents happen. They can be benign ones, so they can be like fat fingering, you know, two and three are very close to each other. And anyone who tried to configure a router in his life, I can guarantee we've done these typos more times than we can, you know, admit that we did. Or it could also be policy violations. So let's say I'm peering with a certain organization, we have some private routes uh, happening, and then we end up leaking them one way or another. There was a very infamous uh, incident that happened in 2008 where Pakistan Telecom was trying to block uh, YouTube for its users inside Pakistan, but they end ended up leaking these routes on the internet, and yeah, that, that caused the global uh, outages. So, what is the, how common are these accidents, right? Um, using manners and BGP stream, I tried to compile a little bit of numbers. Um, it would be helpful for if we can have these reports finalized. Uh, there was very well one, a uh, very good one in 2020, but now we have to go and look for the individual numbers a little bit here and there. So as you can see, there are quite a few incidents happening, but I'm happy to report that in 2021, as compared to 2020, there had been some reductions in some types of incidents, like as big as 60% in terms of reduction. So in terms of possible hijacks, in 2021, around 775 were registered, as opposed to 2,255 in 2020, right? So that's a big change. That also means that there's something good happening over here. And um, we'll get into that a few minutes later. So, we've seen it globally. What does it look like here in the MENOG region? So also using the uh, Manners Observatory tool from the Internet Society, I tried to show you just to compile some slides. Never mind the numbers. Um, these, uh, like, there, there are a lot of variations, but these are some of the incidents that were reported in the last year alone in the MENOG region. And as you can see, that it's pretty consistent that most of the countries here, they have reported some sort of incidents. Now, these incidents can be benign ones, so it can happen unnoticed, and some of them can be catastrophic, right? We all know when, for example, uh, Facebook gets disconnected for two hours because of a certain uh, something or the Google services because something happened with BGP over there. They stopped for a couple of hours, etc. But there are also some benign uh, incidents that happen. They happen, no big effect, and they go away. But I'm just saying here that even here, we have consistently reported incidents. And I'll use this to introduce RPKI. 
All right. So RPKI is a framework and a tool set, but I'll be like clear from the beginning. It doesn't help with all types of incidents, but it fixes like and limits a lot of them, and especially the ones that might cause severe damages. So what is RPKI, the Resource Public Key Infrastructure? I'll explain it with three basic ideas. The first one, it's a tool set and a framework to tie IP addresses and ASM numbers to public keys. So from now on, if I tell you that, hey, my ASN is associated with this IP, where I'm announcing this IP addresses, there would be some cryptographical element here that you can use in order to verify if I'm telling you the truth or not. The second idea is that it follows the RAR hierarchy. Just like when you use uh, HTTPS certificates and it starts at the CA, like the VeriSigns and the GoDaddy's and so on, we have this structure, this hierarchy, and it follows the RAR hierarchy. So we have five source of truth. We call them the trust anchors. These are operated by the RIP NCC, LACNIC, AFRINIC, ARIN, and APNIC. So these are the RARs. So we issue certificates, we give our LAR members these certificates, and then, of course, there's the public key, private keys, and all of this, and using these keys, the members can further delegate down or they can create what we call ROAs. And the ROAs is what you see here as the third point. These are authorized statements that basically say this ASN um, is authorized to announce this IP address, and you sign it. So that's the basic idea behind RPKI. So I'm not going to go into details uh, around that, but I have to say that RPKI is two different things. So far, everything that I said is that I use this certificate, I create a statement that says, this AS will announce my IP addresses. So that's the signing part. This is what you see on the left side. The other part of RPKI is the validation part. So from now on, if I try to announce to you something in BGP, you can use this data that I created, the ROAs, in order to validate things, right? And the nice thing about RPKI is that you can do either or. So even if you never created or signed your ROAs, you can do validations, all right? And even if you don't want to do validations, you can create ROAs. And I'll just take this opportunity to say that at the end of today, there's a ROA signing party. Natalie is in the room with us as well. I'll be helping out as well. Please come. If you haven't signed your ROAs, uh, like uh, you haven't created your ROAs, we'll help you do that. It's really a matter of minutes. All right? So I would like to give now um, some statistics on each side, the signing part and the validation part. Let's start with the signing side. So we, again, we wanted to look at the MENOC region as a whole and try to compare it to the overall service region and to Western Europe. Um, there's a mix, let me put it this way. On this graph, we see the number of LARs who either never did anything with RPKI, that's the gray part, we don't like this. There's the green part that actually got their LAR certificates, all right, and actually started signing with ROAs. So they started creating ROAs. It could be for all of their space or it could be for a part of their space. And then there's the yellow part. The yellow part is actually the LARs who got their LAR certificates, so they made the first step but they haven't created ROAs yet, all right? Um, generally, in the MENOC region, there, there's a lot of diversity. So we can see that countries like Turkey, Lebanon, uh, Palestine, and Iraq, they are above the averages, but there are other countries that like, for example, we're gonna see them in the next slide. Oh, yeah, like uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, not doing as good as uh, we'd hope them to be. But at that point in time, we're just talking about the number of LARs. How does this compare when we talk about the actual address space? So what you can see here 
is the actual distribution of the total address space in the MENOG region according to who is holding them in terms of countries, of course. So the bigger part here is Turkey, it holds around 48.1% of the IPv4 address space. Then it's followed by Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, Kuwait, <coughs> Syria, Palestine, and so on. All right? So I wanted just to overlay here who is not doing well in uh, RPKI. And it turns out that three of the bigger players, which are Saudi Arabia, currently holding the second largest space in terms of IPv4, and the UAE and Syria not doing a lot of IPKI. So we try to divide them. I'm not sure if you can see them here. Uh, the colors are not reflected very well. So there's, let's say here, uh, this is uh, Saudi Arabia. So there is a part of it that has RPKI, so they got certificates, but no ROAs were created. This is the low hanging fruit. This is a matter of minutes and they can create it. And there's the part that says no RPKI, they actually like never touched, they didn't even get uh, a certificate for that. So how does this translate on the global IPv4 space? Like, in each country, what is the percentage of the IPv4 space that is covered by RAW? And you can see that there's diversity here as well. Turkey and Lebanon are leading the way. These are big countries in terms of LARs. Then there, uh, the Yemen is here, but Yemen is a special case because a uh, very few number of uh, networks over there. And the numbers start going down. They are okay-ish, except for the bottom three, which are UAE, KSA, and Syria. But these numbers on their own are not very indicative. Okay, let, let's say for example, uh, Qatar or Kuwait, 73%, 73.9. But what does it actually say? Is it like from last year they were 0% and this year they are 73%? Did they do something 10 years ago and they went to 73% and they stopped there? So. That's why I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and try to see a historical view of how things change. And you can also see here that there are certain diversities. Um, I hope that the colors are reflecting. Yeah, there it's better. So you can see that there are some countries like the UAE. They were, they leaded in the, that space back in 2012. They started creating some stuff and then they stopped. So, uh, but there are other countries, let's say for example Qatar, which you see here in the orange space, they joined the game a little bit late, so that's in 2021, we've done a lot of work with them, and then it started shooting up and ramping up the numbers a little by a little. That's the V4 uh, view of things. I wanted to look at the V6, how are we doing? Unfortunately, not as good. So uh, in IPv4, we see the trends going up, and IPv6, not that much. And here, I would like to tie back and circle back to what my colleague Alvaro said. Even if you're not using actively IPv6, but you're announcing it in one way or another in BGP, or even if you're not announcing it in BGP, if you're not protecting your IPv6 space, Others can use it in order to do bad things, whether it's spam campaigns, uh, DDoS, whatever. We've all heard of Mirai botnet, right? Right, the IoT black ghost thingies. Well, there are new flavors of it, like Reaper botnet, that is actively recruiting IPv6 IoT devices vulnerable. So there are bad things that can happen if we don't actively protect our IPv6 space, just like we would protect IPv4 space. So for the other countries, like uh, from the Levant area, more of that, we can see some positive trends. For example, in Lebanon, you see that it's uh, coming up. Jordan, the same. Uh, Syria, not so much. Kuwait, Bahrain, and Turkey. Again, when I compare V4 to V6, I see the same trend. While we see a level of protection uh, coverage up to 97%, let's say, in IPv4. I look at Lebanon in terms of uh, IPv4, IPv6 uh, space covered by RAW, and it's roughly in the 27%. So you can see that there's a lot of discrepancy, and this has to be fixed. Now, is it easily fixable? What I want to do now is that I would like to take three 
countries that aren't doing so good, three countries that are doing good, and see how, how, how is the landscape in this country. So KSA, let's start with this. Is it hard to bring KSA from the zero point something percent that they are currently at in terms of coverage up to a high level? And we started looking at the LERs in these countries. So you see that, for example, you have STC alone, they have 52% of the address space there in KSA. And they are yellow, so they have their certificates, they just did not start the ROA. So if they start doing that, and again, it's a matter of minutes, not hours, not weeks, not months, you can see, for example, KSA overnight shooting to 53%, let's say. That's, that's something big. Of course, it can be gradual, it can be do, uh, done in phases, etc. So from one side, there's SEC, there's another player, uh, they have like 28%. So if just these two LERs, they decide to move forward with this, you can see tomorrow, next week, next month, uh, KSA shooting up to 80%. So it's not something hard to be done. And I know for a fact that there's active work that is going to happen in 2023, whether it's in UAE or KSA or Qatar, in order to tackle the RPKI and the ROA signing parts. This is a little bit mirrored in the UAE. So in the UAE, you might know that there are two major players there. There's Do and the Tisalat. So Do is the green part that you see here. Um, and you have uh, a Tisalat, which is the bigger part, that's to, uh, to the left. And they hold almost 60% of the space in the UAE. So, and I know, again, that next year, this is an active project in the, uh, from the regulators in the UAE. So if just this Allah switches their ROAs and they sign their ROAs, you'll see the UAE shooting to 90% and 95% as well. When it comes to Syria, <coughs> it's a little bit uh, more challenging there because you see there's a fragmentation part. There's a, so it's not like one network holds a very huge space. But we do have like Syria Tel, they hold like 35% of their space. Uh, they have a certificate, so even there, there's some active room uh, to grow. So we've seen the bad players. Let's see how the better players are doing here. Let's start with Bahrain. Bahrain is doing well. So we have STC and Batelco, both of them. They have their certificates and they've done ROAs. Uh, there's Zain Bahrain. I, th I've, I think I've heard that they have plans to start uh, to, to also do something with uh, ROA next year. So uh, hopefully we do that. So Bahrain is good. Turkey, you see it's a green landscape. So that could be because the uh, regulation part, peering facilities, uh, active community over there. Uh, Turkey is doing green pretty much everywhere. The same for Lebanon. In Lebanon maybe because there's uh, like an incumbent, like one uh, network that owns all the international bandwidth. So maybe because of this monopoly, they were able to force the other networks that want to get their traffic out to use RPKI. It could also be because there's an active community over there. And in Oman, Oman is a smaller country, but we can also see that like everything is green there. Also, probably uh, there is a good regulation framework and a good society over there in terms of keeping up with the uh, security standards out there. So that's the signing parts. These are the numbers and statistics related to the signing part. Now, for the last stats that I would like to share, it covers the validation part. So remember, everything I've talked so far are operators who got their certificates, signed their space. It doesn't mean that the operators in these countries are validating what others are telling them in, uh, in BGP. So if we take the, this sort of measurement, the numbers change drastically. All right, and this is, these are some stats uh, coming from our sister organization, APNIC. And you see, for example, that Syria that has been doing bad in terms of signing ROA, they are number one in terms of validating. Why is that? Because probably also because they have one incumbent, Syria Telecom or whoever that is, 
that is receiving all the international traffic. Maybe they are doing RPKI validation there, and that can skew a little bit the measurements. Lebanon follows uh, after that, but it's uh, at 67%, but it's nowhere close to the 97% uh, that they were doing in terms of signing. And the numbers go down and down and down. So basically, this is everything that I wanted to share with you uh, this morning. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, yeah, find me or ask me now. And please come to the ROA signing party. I think we also have some t-shirts to distribute. But yeah, uh, sign your ROAs will help you. It's a matter of minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Michelle. This is on. Uh, good morning, Chad. Thank you. That was interesting, as always. Um, my name is Nishal Govadan. I'm speaking with no hats. I have a question about the procedure to get your ROAs installed. Uh, we've got many tools that require cryptograph crypto cryptography. Uh, DNSSEC and uh, RPKI are probably the two most common ones in the RIR world. But I know that in other regions, we've seen very slow uptake because the failure of these tools hurts the person that's trying to adopt them. In other words, if I'm trying to do DNSSEC and I make a mistake, I end up shooting myself in the foot. If I try to sign or create a ROA and I make a mistake, I do the same thing. I end up shooting myself in the foot. So do you have specific tools to help first timers not make those mistakes so that they can be relatively assured that as they create these sometimes really difficult to understand cryptographic features or tools, um, they're not shooting themselves in the foot. Yes, first of all, come to our robot signing party. I'm going to be doing a demo for that. You're going to see how easy it is. Um, we have a dashboard. Let's make it easy. There are different flavors or modes of deploying RPKI. You can decide to go hardcore and say, I'm going to host everything. I'm going to generate my keys, do the rollovers, etc." Fine, you can do that. Or, because we at the RIPE NCC, we care about your mental well-being, we came up with a mode that says, you don't have to do anything. It's just a couple of buttons and a portal, everything is automated for you. You don't see the private keys, the public keys, the certificates, you don't have to deal with it. You don't have to maintain it, you don't have to, to do the key rollover sets, etc. It is just a portal, almost as easy as uh, like clicking a couple of buttons, and that's it, we do things for you. And you can only do things for your own space. So you cannot affect others in, the, uh, in this area. So I do agree, while failures might cause some issues, we try to reduce the margin of errors as much as possible. Um, there are many interfaces through which you can interact with our RPKI framework, so you can have the, uh, the GUI, you can have an API, you can have a CLI interface, etc. cetera. Uh, please come to the ROA signing party, we'll be having a demo, and you'll see how easy it is. We even have a service called DRIS, which is a distributed uh, root collectors across the world, we see what you're doing in BGP. So we can tell you that these are the IP addresses that uh, you are the holder of, and they are being announced by these ASNs. They are not covered by ROAs. Do you want to cover them? You just select them, you click a button, and we'll create the whole thing for you. It can be as easy as this. Of course, there, there is much to be said in that space. We give a lot of training courses around that, webinars, like, uh, we have the online academy. So we try to help as much as possible, but I'm trying to simplify the, the whole process now. <laughs>